Hello, uh, I want to continue where we left off the last time, and that was looking at the Great Depression. We spent most of our time looking at the 1920s and how the 1920s contributed to the crash of the American economy. And I guess by way of summary, I cannot understate how incredibly devastated the American economy was. That this was an unprecedented event in American history. And what is so remarkable about this is that we had just, I mean, the whole 1920s, we argued, was this period of paradox. This period of, on the one hand, moving forward, and, it, and on the other hand, people wanting to resist change and trying to move backwards. And here we have this incredibly, what seemed on the surface to be, an incredibly robust economy that was unparalleled in the world, it was said. In fact, we will, today as we look at, when we move beyond the Depression, we'll look at the uh, foreign policy. And because of the tremendous economic growth and vitality of America in the 1920s, some countries who were envious and resentful of American influence, particularly economic influence in foreign policy, referred to America as the new Rome, the new Rome in the world. It was that powerful. And yet, in 1928, we have suddenly, although there were some warning signs, as we pointed out, this incredible economic engine grounds to a halt. In the end, no sector of American life is unaffected by the Great Depression. By 1931, the Great Depression had set in. And there were so many things that became commonplace but, but bizarre for this country. It was bizarre, for instance, by 1932, at the, and that was the bottom of the Great Depression, the year of the bottom of the Great Depression. It was bizarre to see grown men and families living in caves in Arkansas because they had nowhere to live. It was bizarre to see people, to see cities made out of crates appear overnight. Cities called Hoovervilles in New York, in Central Park, there was an area called Hoover Valley. The greatest country in the world, we could see people standing outside of garbage dumps, women and children and men scavenging for rotten food. People would line up outside of restaurants. And as they threw away leftover food and, and it spoiled food, they fought among themselves to get the scraps. This was not a third world country. This was not Russia or Europe or Latin America. This was the United States of America. And it was hard to believe. 
It affected families. Psychologically, it is hard to underestimate the effect psychologically on Americans who had grew up, whose families had grown up, and whose families before had grown up with certain assumptions. And those assumptions were that if a person had those traits that we talked about way back in the beginning of the course, who had industry, who had initiative, and who were hard workers who showed up for work every day, that this could not have happened to them. They didn't understand what had gone wrong. And many blamed themselves for what had happened to America by 1932. And in fact, as I pointed out last time, some business spokesmen blamed the Americans and said it had to do with the lack of American fiber, moral fiber. That is what caused the Great Depression. But as we saw, that's, that was not what caused the American Depression. The overall, we, we went over a number of different causes, but the overall, the overriding generalization was that the American economy was not nearly as sound as it had been made, as, as Americans had been made to think during the 1920s. That was the fact. And now people had to adjust to this incredible period. The rate of divorces declined. People were afraid. People were a lot less reluctant to get married during the Great Depression. But while they were a lot more reluctant to get, uh, to get a divorce, the desertion rate soared in America. Men who felt like they were not men, who felt like they were not breadwinners, who lost their self-esteem and their, and their self-dignity, left their families. By 1940, the tail end of the Depression, at the end of the Depression, more than 150,000 married women lived apart from their husbands. The number of neglected children in America because of hard times soared. Children in unprecedented numbers were neglected or abandoned. Orphanages found themselves at times overflowing with children who had simply been dropped off at the doorstep. More than 200,000 children with no place to go roamed the streets of America. And then you had people who were so desperate for jobs that they did anything they could to enhance the possibility of getting a job. For instance, when a woman went to apply for a job, and if she was married, she would, before the interview, would take the wedding band off in hopes that what? That, that would increase her attractiveness. To the employer. Many Jewish Americans changed their names to good old Anglo-Saxon names in an effort to help them find employment. Those African Americans who were the product of interracial mixing and were light enough to pass for white, they often passed for white in order to try to find jobs. And not only jobs, but as we will see in a moment, 
blacks were disproportionately discriminated in terms of relief, it was much easier for a white person after the Great Depression truly set in by 1932 for whites to get relief now, which was a switch, because it had always been just the opposite historically. It was always much easier to get relief in America than a job, because jobs are very special. It says something very special about the people. So those who could not get jobs always found relief. Now you have, we will see a switch, a switch in, in two ways. For instance, blacks and Mexican-Americans. Mexican-Americans in the Southwest, when the Great Depression came, they formed workers' unions to keep from being laid off. They closed ranks in the Southwest and in particularly in California. But often what happened was that as the depression became so bad, and as so many whites were unemployed, you had a unofficial policy of trying to discourage Mexican Americans from staying in the country. So many who were legal Mexican Americans, immigrants, citizens, or illegal, and sometimes it didn't matter, they were often rounded up and sent back to Mexico, leaving now jobs which whites gladly accepted, and which would not have accepted under any other terms. Those jobs that involved working in the fields. It became so bad even when they weren't often coerced to leave, Mexican-Americans left to go back to Mexico. African-Americans, who had the reputation of always being the last hired and the first fired, who had occupied a certain niche in American society, again, occupying an a, a economic status for jobs that really no one wanted. These were called Negro jobs, in fact. They were the janitors. They were the porters. They worked in the coat rooms. They were the domestics. But as the Great Depression deepened, you had a phenomena called the substitution of whites for Negro jobs that blacks were harried out of their jobs to make room for whites, who before the Great Depression would have never considered these jobs. The Depression created all kinds of hardships. I remember talking to, and this is one period in our history in which it wasn't that long ago that we have relatives who are still alive, who grew up, who went through the Great Depression. At some point, you should talk to them about it. And you will find how deeply affected, how deeply and profoundly scarred many Americans were as a result of this experience. You can learn a lot to talk to your grandparents and great-grandparents about what it was like to live through the Great Depression. I talked to mine and I remember that indeed certain members of my father's family and my mother's family were light enough to pass for white and they did in the South. They passed for white to be able to get jobs and to get relief which had been simply cut off from the black population. And then they would sneak back under the cover of darkness to share what they had gotten with the rest of the family uh, who were of a darker hue. So these things were a part of the Great Depression. Men sometimes wondered, when, I quote, this one man said that sometimes I feel like a murderer because he couldn't take care of his family. He said, what's wrong with me? 
that I can't protect my family. Men in America, the American tradition, at the core of what it meant to be a man in America was the ability to do what? To be a, to be a fully functioning man in this country at this time. The most important thing was to be able to do what? To protect and take care of one's family. Not to be able to do that at this time stripped away a person's sense of their self-worth. As the depression deepened in certain areas of the country, the criteria for relief became arbitrary. In the South, in Houston, I pointed out, in the, in, in the city of Houston, they simply did not give blacks and Hispanics relief. They simply just, what they had, they gave to the white population. Angry, unemployed whites acting out of both racism but also a sense of despair and displaced aggression. Charlotte slogans in the South like, no jobs for niggas until every white man has a job. The KKK membership increased. Lynchings tripled between 1932 and 1933. The KKK sort of modified an old saying that uh, dead men tell no lives. The KKK now had another one in which they updated for the Great Depression. They said that dead blacks take no jobs from white men. That was their motto in the 1930s. In 1935 alone, there were more than two dozen blacks lynched. The most famous trial, the most famous incident involving blacks was in 1931, it involved the so-called Scottsboro Boys, the Scottsboro Boys. What had happened in America was that without any visible means of support, Thousands of Americans, both black and white, who had no places to go, no place to go, they began to ride the rails. Riding the rails became very common. Hobos, you've seen people who, who jump on the trains and, and, they, and they just simply live free like that. Well, I don't know if it's free, but they live the best way they can. You know? And they lived off of this lifestyle. I mean, it was certainly not a phenomenon peculiar to blacks. But it, uh, whites suffered uh, so much that they too, you could see, you could see almost a whole population often. It was illegal to ride the rails, but nonetheless, Americans did in great numbers. Well, on one train in the south in Alabama, close to a place called Scottsboro, a group of black, young, young black men boarded this box car and it was already occupied by some white men and two white women. Well, if you can imagine, here you have people who are both in such desperate st straits that if anything, you know, they should have reached out and pulled one another up on the train. But instead, given this time in American history, they resent it. Here they are unemployed, illegally riding the rails, but they resented the presence of blacks on, in this boxcar. So they told them to get off. What ensued was an altercation, and instead of the blacks getting off, they threw 
the whites off. That left the two white women on the train. Well, nothing happened to them, but the whites who got off the train were so angry that they immediately informed the police, the sheriff, and at the next station, the train was stopped. They were rounded up and soon accusations from the two white females that they had been raped by these nine black men who ranged from the age of 14 into their early 20s. In the end, one, I mean, here you have these young women taken and they are badgered because they were told, the, 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 the group that was thrown off told the sheriff that they had assaulted the women. Well, that can get, that got Southerners riled up, as you can imagine. So, the women were taken. At first, they, they, they said nothing happened. But then after the badgering, after the social pressure, soon they confessed that they had been raped by these men, young men. Soon it became a national case as these men were tried in Scottsboro, Alabama for the rape of these two white women. Even though shortly after one of the white women recanted her statement, she said she just couldn't go through with the lie. That the only sex that they had had, had was with her boyfriend several days earlier, but it had nothing to do with these men. In fact, she became so committed to freeing these young men that she traveled around the country raising money for their defense and telling the truth. Certainly a tribute to her own personal character. But these nine young men, as the one newspaper put it, in, to, to arouse Southern sentiment. You, here you have people unemployed. You have people who are suffering. We talk about how people look for escape goats to deal with their own internal pain. Newspapers flashed headlines, nine big, black, burly brutes rape white women. That inflamed the people in Alabama wanted to see their version of justice carried out. It becomes a famous trial in the end with a number of Supreme Court decisions. None of the boys are eventually executed. Over a period of some 20 years, they will be freed. Okay, but it will take more than 20-some years for the last one to be freed. In the North, it, was just, it wasn't just the South. In the North, blacks were unemployed. 30 to 60 percent more than whites. They were what someone referred to as surplus men. But the Great Depression also troubled Americans in the sense that they had believed that economically they were invincible. That technology had become, the critics argued, that technology had become their god in the 1920s. Technology which made mass production possible. Technology which, had now, which now had created the ability to mass produce so much to create plenty. And now some argue that this God had turned their back on them, that this technology which had been used to create plenty now was no longer the blessing they thought it was, 
but was now a curse. That the production. And in fact, this was particularly true of farmers. Because, as we talked about last time, the farmers never seemed to get a, <laughs> I don't think they ever seemed to get a fair shake, whether by man or by nature. That the more they produced with refined techniques and technology, the weaker their prices became. They began to pray now for pestilence to destroy their crops. They began to pray for bad weather to destroy their crops. In Brazil, when a bug infected the coffee beans, the coffee growers shouted with glee and happiness. It's a strange reaction. Those who raise grapefruit and the rubber planters also, uh, there was an, uh, an insect that had infected their crops, and they were happy to see their crops wither on the vine. Because what would this do? It would push prices up. And as we will see, there will even be a government-sponsored program in a moment to actually destroy plenty, to take goods, to take food and products out of circulation. Well, I talked about what happened to Herbert Hoover as he approached the Great Depression. Hoover tried. And Hoover was not, and certainly, as I indicated, was not a man who was unqualified or not up intellectually for the task of fighting for America during the Great Depression. Hoover was an extremely intelligent man and was a supreme manager when it came to efficiency. Much of the savings much of the efficiency in factories and the coordination between railroads and things like that during the World War I, Herbert Hoover was a great part of that. But somehow, Hoover could not bring himself. He understood that the government needed to get involved in this crisis at the outset and made some attempts to infuse government money, made some attempts to commit, to get companies to commit to maintaining a minimal price to keep the prices from, uh, minimum wages to keep wages from dropping further. He did everything he could in that sense, short of a massive government program that would come to characterize FDR's administration. What he did not understand, though, is that his approach, which we characterized as volunteerism, was simply not enough for this incredible, this major, unprecedented economic catastrophe. The best example of this was, was when he approached relief. He totally, flat out, refused to entertain thoughts that the federal government had any business providing relief, no matter how serious this economic depression was that it was simply went contrary to everything that Americans believed and stood for. That for the federal government, for a national government, to become involved in large-scale relief would create a nation of wards to the state. 
It would create a welfare state. It would destroy all the characteristics that had come to make Americans who they were. And so he backed away from that. He, he relied on local and state agencies to provide relief. But in this situation, local and state relief agencies very quickly showed that they simply could not handle the enormous number of people who were now on relief or needed relief. And he made it worse in 1932, which guaranteed he would not, uh, that, that FDR would win uh, in the election of 1932 when he had an American, at this point, an American hero, when he had General MacArthur, I talked about that, drive veterans, men who had sacrificed men who had lost limb, men who had come back from World War I with mustard gas afflictions. In other words, men who had laid their lives on the line for America were forced off of the nation's capital at a place called Anacostia Flats, so we talked about that, the Bonus Army, those who asked the, the government to speed up the promised bonus payment for, their ser for the time they had served in World War I. Instead of being treated civility like the heroes they were, MacArthur treated them like criminals. In fact, accused them that, they were, that this whole bonus army thing was a conspiracy of the communists. I think a part of, as we will see, a part of the reason that many veterans, when they are polled in 1937, will almost be united in the belief that they don't want to go to war for Europe because of their experience in the way that they were treated by their own country here. And a part of that had to do with MacArthur's uh, ego. But it made Hoover look insensitive. Hoover was not responsible, I should point out. MacArthur, as, MacArthur, as he would always do in his life, would always exceed his authority. Here's a man who had a tremendous ego. I mean, it's hard to, to measure MacArthur's ego. PBS did a wonderful two-part series on the life of MacArthur, and I think it captures so eloquently that this man believed he belonged to a very special group of men, a very few. This was, it was in very few company with men like him, but that he was destined to be great, and he was going to make sure that he achieved it his greatness. He was driven by that. And in some ways his arrogance accounted for many of MacArthur's, uh, MacArthur's mistakes, both in, at uh, Anacostia Flats and when he will disobey Truman during the Korean War, which will lead to his final uh, uh, chastising, I like to, to, uh, to recall it. But even though Hoover was not responsible, he got the blame. He got the blame for both the Depression and for acts like the Bonus Army fiasco. It gave the Democrats an opportunity that they had not had in a number of years. It gave them a chance to seize the presidency. But one could argue, though, in 1932, and that was this a, a prize <laughs> that anybody wanted. And that's a remarkable thing about the man who becomes president, I think, 
1932 and takes office in 1933. I mean, if you read accounts of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's inaugural address when he, in, in March of 1933, some have compared it to, have compared the atmosphere to one of a funeral rather than one of great celebration of a presidential victory. But in many ways, if there was any man, and there's always this, this saying that historians have, this belief that the man and the hour come together. That for America, while I will argue that FDR does not get America out of the Great Depression, that the New Deal does not solve the Great Depression. Well, I will argue that, I will also argue that no one could have taken America through the Great Depression the way that FDR did. The president as he ran for office in 1932, didn't have a lot of specific ideas about how to attack this economic monster that had seized America. FDR was born to an affluent Hyde Park family in 1882. Like his cousin Teddy Roosevelt, he had been privately tutored, gone to private schools, gone to Harvard. He had gone to Columbia, to law school, where he studied law, but he didn't finish, actually, he didn't finish law school, but he still was bright enough that he passed the New York bar and could practice law. He certainly did not grow up in an environment of need or want. He grew up on a 187-acre estate in Hyde Park. And yet, in spite of that, his political career and his life up to 1932 demonstrated that in spite of his patrician background, that he was able to understand the masses of American people. That, that, not, that did not stand in the way of his understanding the masses of American people. A part of that, perhaps, might be rooted in his early experience. As I indicated, he, he went to, to Columbia. There he met, in 1905, uh, his distant cousin. I guess that's okay. You know, and, you know, I guess it depends on how distant she was. But he, he met Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, and... They had a mutual respect for one another's intellect and independence. Because certainly you won't find many first ladies in American history who were as independent as First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. But they had a great deal of respect for one another and they, I guess they fell in love. That's what happens, I, I suppose. And they got married. FDR always thought, though, that from a very early age that he was destined for bigger things. It is interesting when we look at great people. Most great people, we looked at Teddy Roosevelt. We looked at Woodrow Wilson. Most of the successful men 
in American history or in the world have a sense that they are what? That they are, and women, that they are destined for greater things. All along, he knew he was destined one day to play an important role in the history of America. Although I don't think he ever imagined it would be the president who was trying to get America out of the worst depression in his history. He began his political career in 1910 as a New York state senator, and he was successful. In 1913, he was Woodrow Wilson's assistant secretary of the Navy. In 1920, he was the Democratic Party's choice for vice president in a losing campaign with Cox against the Republicans. No one could have beaten the Republicans in 1920. And then at a critical point in his life, in 1921, at the very young, well, relatively young age of 39, he contracts polio. The disease will ravage Roosevelt's body to a point that he will be paralyzed from the waist down. That most of the time he will be seen the rest of his life in a wheelchair or if he is standing, it will be with the aid of extremely heavy braces and a cane. Some men after that, with the wealth that he had, could have easily what turned away. Could have simply come to the conclusion that this was the denouement of my political life. That this was the end. Instead, it seemed to, en to energize a man who already had energy. It seemed to simply be just one more challenge for him to overcome. This ordeal, I think, will prepare Roosevelt for the Great Depression because he once told his told a close friend about, about life. He said, sometimes it is in the darkest moments that we really find our true selves. He said that he remembered that all he wanted once he contracted polio was to be able to wiggle his big toe. And he said that once he could wiggle his big toe, everything else in life would be easy. Everything else was a piece of cake. It was that kind of attitude, I think, that makes him right for the Great Depression. Because he can inspire people. He does inspire people. He believes that what the country needed in 1933 when he, becomes, when he takes the oath of office is that what America needs is simply confidence. That the first order of business he will say in his inaugural address is to restore confidence in business and confidence in America. As he put it, let me first assert my firm belief that the only thing that we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needs effort. I mean, after all, he would know about paralyzing and about fear as his life seemed to end 
1921. So he was not afraid of anything. He promised to ask Congress. He made no illusions about how grave the situation was, though. He promised the Americans that he would ask Congress to give him the power necessary. And he prepared the power he would need to the power that a president would have in time of war. That he would ask the Congress to give him the same kind of power as if the country had been invaded by a foreign country. Because that's how serious the crisis was. He was, as one contemporary told him, he said, Franklin, Yours is the first opportunity to carve a name in the halls of immortals beside Jesus. Now, that's a very strong statement that this, that this situation was so incredible that one of his friends told him that you had the opportunity to carve a name in the halls of immortals besides Jesus. That's a heck of an opportunity. <laughs> well, I think FDR, and I think it was true once what one colleague said about FDR, that FDR had a second-rate intellect. In other words, he was not a brilliant man, okay? I mean, during the entire campaign, FDR never specifically outlined any specific program as to how he was going to save America or how he was going to deal with the question. He always talked about the country and what he was going to do in the most general, sometimes even, it seemed, evasive terms. But while perhaps he did, while perhaps he had a second-rate intellect, he had a first-rate temperament, this person said. He was unafraid to try new things. After contracting polio, how could you be afraid to try anything new? Experimentation was one of Roosevelt's strength. He would not be bound or limited by convention or tradition in dealing with this unprecedented crisis in America. And he was not, uh, I should point out that here was a man, we talk about this idea of, of sense of destiny. When he ran for president, there was some opposition against Roosevelt from within his own party from, from Southerners, the Southern Bloc. But to mollify the Southern opposition, he appointed John Nance Gardner of Texas as vice president, which was a an astute political move. Gardner was extremely well respected. He was Speaker of the House. And Gardner told FDR, he said, Franklin, this is our election. He says, all you have to do to win this election is stay alive to election day. <laughs> but that wasn't, apparently that, that must not be a Roosevelt trait because he didn't just stay alive. He sort of, in many ways, imitated Teddy Roosevelt. Instead, here is a man who is paralyzed from the waist down. He 
will show an incredible amount of energy. And I think people never forgot that during the campaign. He will travel on the whistle stop campaign. He will travel 13,000 miles across country till he reaches the West Coast, stopping along the way, 13,000 miles. And he will give 100 speeches along the way. Sounds like a man who's not simply content with just winning the election. I mean, sounds like he, again, is driven by something more than just a victory. So again, it, it reminds me of uh, Teddy Roosevelt, his, his cousin. He did give some hint, though, as to how he would attack this economic malaise that had befallen America. While he was not specific, he did say that he would use the federal, the power of the federal government to lift the republic out of the depression. And then he went on to make that wonderful statement that I pledge you, I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. A lot of people when they heard that felt breathed a sigh of relief because here they felt that with someone if he had the confidence surely they could get behind him. Roosevelt does not waste any time. Again he is not afraid of experimentation. Roosevelt will immediately ask Congress to get behind him. And essentially, he can do this because with the election of 1932, not only is he elected, but Democrats will sweep both houses. It will be the greatest Democratic majority in Congress since the days before the Civil War. Now, that's a victory. They will have the greatest majorities in, the, in, in Congress, the Democratic Party, since the days before the Civil War. So in other words, he had the votes to pass his legislation. And he immediately began to do so. He first, and this is called the first 100 days, his first 100 days, he said, was critical. He passed, well, he said the first order of business was to deal with the banks, to save the nation's banks. I point out that by 1932, more than, and some, it's been estimated between six and 14,000 American banks had collapsed, that nobody believed in the banks anymore. So he had to restore faith in the banks. So he passes the Emergency Banking Act of 1933. This act would first close all the banks on March the 5th and declare it a banking holiday that the banks will close uh, on March the 5th for a banking holiday. That was for a reason. That under the Emergency Banking Act, it would give the federal government time under this bill to expand federal credit to the banks. It would give the federal government time to expand federal credit to the banks. They would, under the Emergency Banking Act, they would authorize the government to reopen banks, but this time under the strictest guidelines, that they would reopen banks 
under the strictest guidelines. But more than that, it wasn't just that they would be open and only the banks that passed the muster of the federal government could be reopened. And any bank that was reopened, its deposits were guaranteed by the federal government. In a few days before the act was passed, Roosevelt conducted his first fireside chat in which he told the American people that it was much better, their money was much safer in a bank than under a mattress. And that the federal government was there to make sure that their banks, that their money would be safe. Shortly right after, the, uh, after this, a second part of the Emergency Banking Act came, and that was the passage of the second Glass-Steagall Banking Act. This was important. For one, the Steagall-Glass Banking Act dealt with the risky and irresponsible practices of commercial banks that we talked about, that these banks that gave, that provided their customers with everything but a roulette wheel. These banks could not open, reopen again unless they subscribed to a very strict federal guidelines. But even more under this act, to back it all up, the government established what we call today, that you know of today, is the, uh, the FDIC, uh, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. That the government will insure individual deposits up to $2,500 in a bank. Now, what you might want to do is put $2,500 in this bank and $2,500 in, 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 in another bank. Today, I think, if I remember, uh, the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, uh, guarantees money up to, is it $100,000 per bank? Yeah, $100,000. Now, well, that's a big increase from $2,500. Now, they will guarantee uh, your money up to $100,000 per account. So if you're worried about the banking, you might want to put that money in several different banks. <laughs> Well, and then he moved. I mean, this was important. Keep in mind, the federal, uh, the, the FDIC is still with us today. It is still, in many ways, the bedrock in which people look to for security when they deal with the banks today, that their money will be there when they want to withdraw it. And it's backed by the force of the national government. That was not there before the Great Depression. The second uh, was the Economy Act. The Economy Act of 1933. FDR believed that obviously that the federal government had to also serve as an example of fiscal, fiscal responsibility and restraint. And so under the Economy Act, the federal government will slash its own budget. And in the process, it will eliminate government, reduce government spending. And then we move right on. You have the passage of the beer and wine Revenue Act. And this couldn't have come any sooner. Because by 1933, given how bad <laughs> the Great Depression was, everybody, believe me, needed a drink. <laughs> so what really the, the uh, Beer and Wine Revenue Act did was to really in prohibition. 
so people could stop drinking jackass brandy and all those uh, those strange concoctions and uh, and or the wealthy would be the only ones who could buy uh, uh, regular liquor and alcohol from the Kennedys. I, I mean, from 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 certain groups. <laughs> so on April the seventh, for the first time since 1919, beer could be legally sold. <laughs> And as I said, it's not a minute too soon. And after a flurry of this initial legislation, Roosevelt moves on. He continues. He turns to two major priorities, the same priorities that Hoover had to deal with. One was how to deal with the problem of unemployment, how to create a recovery for the economy, which meant getting rid of unemployment. And secondly, or maybe first, how to deal, how to deal with the massive relief that was needed in America in 1933. You will have a number of bills passed that will attempt to do one of both of these things. The first would be the CCC or the Civilian Conservation Corps. This was, in a sense, you can see this, this act, the CCC, doing both. It would provide it would take young men, okay, it would take young men, 18 and over, it would take them to forest, to camps, to outdoors sorts of places, where they would be given lodging, food, but they would also be paid a salary. They would engage in certain activities such as building bridges, planting trees, constructing dams, and even making fire, uh, fire trails in the nation's woods. The CCC would employ eventually more than two million Americans. Now, the money, this is, this, this is a, it, it's a two-pronged effect. Actually, I could even argue that it was, they believed that by taking these unemployed men from the cities, they could benefit from the what? The fresh air of working out in uh, the outdoors. And I think there's that's something to say for that. I mean, if you think about what was happening in the cities at this time. But the money that they would receive, they were expected to send that money back to their families. Their families would then be expected to do what with the money? They would be expected to spend that money right away. Because as they spent that money in the economy, would they not do what? Everything has to begin... You, to buy goods, you know, you have to, one, you have to get rid of that surplus before you can begin to produce new products. So you have to buy them. So they will hope, they was hope that the money spent would help go toward, again, revitalizing the economy. And then you have the works, pro, uh, the work, I'm sorry, the Progress Works Administration commonly known as the W, uh, PWA, I'm getting ahead of myself, the, the PWA, under the direction of Harold X. Now, I'm not sure X was the best man for this job because Congress appropriated $3 billion for the 
PWA, the Works Progress, uh, the Progress Works Administration. It was to be used in an ambitious plan of public construction. However, the PWA was, was hamstrung by Ix's penny-pitching ways. I mean, he had $3 billion and he held on to it like it was, it was his own money. You know I mean, they, they said he, had, he wanted to account for every penny that was spent that day. If, there was a, if, 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 if they spent money on a typewriter, he wanted a receipt for it. He could not, would not get money into circulation fast enough. Well, and then you had a, uh, and a very important program. The, the short name was FARA, the, but it was the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. The Federal Emergency Relief Administration. Now, this was under Harold Hopkins. Most of his friends called him Harry Hopkins. Hopkins had been a former social, social worker and I think had a better sense about how to run these programs than Harold X. Under the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, this bill allocated $500 million dollars to the state and local governments to dispense to needy families. Actually, the way it worked in the end uh, was that $250 million of, uh, of FARA would go to the state and local governments. And the other $250 million would be used at the discretion of Hopkins himself, okay, uh, to be dispensed the way uh, that he felt. Now, the only problem with the uh, with the money was that often there were complaints that the money on the local and state level were not going to the people that it should have. But nonetheless. These were all emergency programs passed to try to get America out of the recession, out of the Great Depression. But again, he doesn't stop. You ever just you have one bill after another. It's almost like a laundry list that we that we're reading. Then you have right after Farah, you have the Civilian Works Administration. Now. This was actually, this program was the brainchild of Harry Hopkins himself. In fact, he persuaded Roosevelt to set up the CWA, the Civilian Works Administration. Now this, the objective of this program was to be a temporary work program, okay, a temporary work program program to give people temporary work which would on the one hand deal with relief on the other hand it also provides employment which hopefully the money will then be turned in what into consumer I mean all these have that component of it too as well that hopefully the money that's spent will be put back into the economy and somehow the economy will be cranked up it doesn't always work that way but under the CWA Within a month, Hopkins had hired under this program, the CWA, more than 2.6 million Americans. He had given 2.6 million Americans jobs under the CWA. What did these people do for the money uh, when they were hired under the Civilian Works Administration? 
And, 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 and this is what amazes me as we look at some of these programs. As, uh, as I, each time I look at this, I, I think at what other time in American history would America have stopped to spend the money to repair some of the infrastructure that was beginning to deteriorate by this time in American history. I mean, there is a plus side of this, that we have some activity that I don't think would have ever been done without the Great Depression. For instance, under the CWA and the WPA, we'll talk about it even more later, that under the CWA, there were over 500,000 miles of roads in America. Over 500,000 miles of roads in America that were refurbished, that were repaired under the CWA. Most states and local governments at this time either did not want to tax their people to prepare or to repair their roads and to refurbish them. We've always, particularly in the South, this was always a very difficult thing to get them to uh, get the southern states to pay for the repair of roads. Uh, or in the old eastern states, it was expensive to have roads repaired. Under the C, uh, WA, more than 500,000 miles of roads will be repaired. And there will be 40,000 schools either repaired or built under the CWA. Again, you, you have to ask yourself, you know, we can't get enough schools built today. Or even, you know, I mean, you, you may go to a school, I don't want to mention cities, in which the roof may collapse on you while you're reading an, uh, a book in the library. Well, of course, we don't know what city that might be. Not only would 40,000 schools be built, but <laughs> they also built over 150,000 outhouses in the South. We talked about outhouses. Now, that's an interesting <laughs> use of the money uh, to build 150,000 outhouses in the South. They also hired actors to give free shows. They hired librarians to catalog archives. But the real objective of this, besides being relief and, and hopefully generating some economic thrust, that these jobs were designed to give people a sense of pride. If America was ever going to rebound, it would come from the people themselves. And as long as the unemployed felt worthless, America would not be able to get back on his feet. As one person put it about when he got a job at the CWA, he said, when I got that CWA card, it was the biggest day of my whole life. At least I could say, I have a job. And that to him was incredibly important. But reviving the economy as a whole was far more difficult than these temporary relief slash sort of uh, economic uh, thrust programs. Because particularly there were certain sections of the economy that were so devastated that it would take massive programs to turn them around. This was particularly true of the farmers. The farmers absolutely, it is hard again to overstate how difficult of a situation the farmers were in to try to turn this around.
Roosevelt would enact the triple A. And I don't mean the automobile club either. The Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1933. When we return, I'll look at what the Agricultural Adjustment Act would do and the rest of the New Deal programs and move on to foreign policy.